I have Josh Rayner here with me today because we podcasted earlier and, um, you know, he'll chime in with some questions, but I have a question to kind of kick things off here. I saw you guys, you and Mike Fave did a video, uh, talking about, you were responding to some of the things that Ken Berry said and Ken Berry talked about glycation. And I think for yourself and Mike and myself and Josh, who's, you know, in, in on this too, with podcasting and, and YouTubing and stuff. And we're just seeing a lot of questions about glycation. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions about, hey, man, doesn't that diet, particular diet, give you diabetes and some of these things? Can you maybe explain to people why um, when they start to introduce some uh, sugars into their diet, some simple sugars into the diet, things like fructose and stuff like that, um, why, it won't, why it won't potentially uh, cause the harm that they're thinking? Obviously, we all four of us would agree, or uh, three of us would agree that, uh, or four of us <laughs> like, uh, would agree that uh, in the presence of a caloric surplus, kind of all hell can break loose. So just, I, it's probably important for people to keep that in mind. As we mentioned, just about anything on the show, and we're talking about like safety and talking about health, if it's in a caloric surplus, then more than likely more damage could be done than if it's in a caloric deficit or just uh, at maintenance calories. I don't know if you agree with that statement or not, but can you explain to people maybe why there may be uh, is some confusion swirling around glucose, fructose, and uh, the potential for a glycation? Yeah. And, you know, I held those beliefs myself at, you know, at those points, uh, back when I was doing low carb, I thought that eating carbs was just going to lead to insulin resistance, diabetes, fatty liver disease, glycation. It was, you know, it's just a, a simple equation, right? Carbs driving more insulin, more blood sugar, and that drives diabetes. And then on the other side, glycation, I mean, it's in the name, right? It's, it's sugar driven. And so if you just eat more carbs, then of course you're gonna have more glycation. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think, when we dig a little bit below the surface, it becomes clear that it's nowhere near that simple. And there's this assumption, I think, within people in that sphere who aren't aware of these other ideas that we'll be sharing, that the people who are promoting that we eat carbs just aren't aware of this connection, that they, they aren't aware that when you have higher blood sugar and higher insulin, that's associated with diabetes, and they aren't aware that glycation exists, and that's going to you know rot your cells and make them all sticky. So. You know, they just don't know that those things are possibilities. But the reality is we're very aware of those things, but it's not as simple as just eating more carbs causes those. And instead we have this conflation where we see something like diabetes and we see blood sugars high. So that must be the driver there. That must be what's causing that, that circumstance. Uh, but it's, it's really not that simple. And so what we actually find is that if we're eating a healthy diet, and we can define what that is, but if we're eating a healthy diet that has a lot of carbohydrates, we should still maintain healthy blood sugar levels, we should still maintain a low hemoglobin A1C, and we shouldn't be seeing fatty liver disease. You know, we're not suggesting that that's the direction we should be heading. We shouldn't be seeing fatty liver. Like, we're, I think we're all on the same page with that. And when it comes to the glycation, there's some conflation there. The first one being that hemoglobin A1C is uh, a marker of glycated hemoglobin. And what it basically means in this circumstance is that um, the red blood cells, you know, are, are in the bloodstream, and so is glucose. And the more interaction they have, the more glycated hemoglobin you're going to see. So if you have higher blood sugar levels over time, you'll see higher HbA1c, higher glycated hemoglobin. It's not ideal. We don't want to be seeing chronically high blood sugar. And there's this assumption that if we're seeing glycated hemoglobin, if we see high A1C, that means that we're seeing glycation everywhere. And there's a number of steps that are being missed in between, you know, in that assumption. Uh, and so the first one being that glycation in the, in the blood is really a very small portion of what's going on in the rest of the body. And we really want to be concerned about glycation going on inside the tissues, which is not just as simple as an interaction between of, of time, glucose, and some protein, but rather it's way more complex. There's a ton of pathways to consider. And carbohydrates are not the only drivers there. It's true that if you give a carbohydrate, or let's say a sugar, you know, glucose or fructose, enough, enough time with a protein, you'll see glycation. But 
that doesn't mean that that's the only place that we can get that glycation from. One of the main drivers of glycation is actually lipid peroxides, so damaged fats that we can have inside our tissues, really anywhere in our bodies, in our arteries, in your liver, you know, anywhere. Uh, those are primary drivers of glycation as well, without any sugar being involved. So, uh, you know, that I think is not often considered. Another one would actually be ketones. So, of course, on a ketogenic diet, we're thinking no sugar, which on one hand is, isn't even true because we know you can still have quite a bit of blood sugar and even higher A1C values on a low carb diet. But there's also the fact that ketones themselves and specifically acetone is a direct precursor to something called methylglyoxal. And methylglyoxal is thousands of times more glycating than glucose is or fructose. And so that's going to be a much greater driver of glycation than something like glucose. And so it, the picture ends up becoming a lot more complex, and it's one that I think is worth digging into, but this overarching assumption that eating more carbs equals more glycation is totally missing all of the other factors that drive glycation and age production, advanced glycation end products. And then they're also missing the other side of the equation, which is the production of something like any glycation product, but if we're saying ages, doesn't, you know, the equation doesn't end there. There's also the clearance of those and the antioxidant systems and specifically glutathione that's really important for clearing out those ages and basically detoxifying them. And that whole side of the equation is very much supported by carbohydrate and by insulin, which both stimulate the production and uh, the regeneration of glutathione. So with all those things being said, it's nowhere near as simple as we look in the literature and we see more advanced glycation end products, the real kind of bad guys on a higher carb diet. That literature is not there at all in humans. If anything, really the only literature that we see that's looking at those sorts of end products in humans tend to show that low carb diets are much more likely to be increasing glycation. There's studies showing increased methylglyoxal on ketogenic diets. And the more ketogenic it is, the more methylglyoxal is produced presumably because of the acetone that gets produced. And there's also studies showing increased lipid peroxidation on low carb diets as well, which is going to be a primary precursor to ages. So I really think it's something where we're, we're zooming in on one really small mechanism in, in a much larger web. And, and then we end up with these sorts of assumptions. Well, a uh, question I had for, for Jay is, and you brought up a um, fatty liver disease, right? And a lot of people think that fatty liver you're gonna get it for non-alcoholic fatty liver from uh, fructose because the fructose goes to the liver and then it's the excess is gonna be converted to fat. But especially one thing I've noticed is like, I had someone uh, ask me a question is they were like very underweight. And she was mm -hmm. like, I have NAFLD and I'm really underweight. And it's like, what, what do I do? It's like, how, do, how does someone even give themselves fatty liver in the first place from seemingly not some like um, crazy junk food diet and then you know, like then how would they get rid of it within that kind of context? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And we know that there can be insulin resistance in people who are like lean or relatively lean or underweight or sometimes have more of the kind of skinny fat presentation. But what we're seeing with fatty liver disease is insulin resistance in the liver. So the liver is taking up fuel, fatty acids uh, and carbohydrates not able to effectively metabolize them and then it's converting those into fats and it's also not effectively excreting them and there's a few different steps there i mean i think the first assumption most people have and it's kind of an odd assumption because um you know we know that fat is a, is a much easier precursor to fat than fructose is which has to go through a number of metabolic steps and and it's relatively ineff inefficient to convert that fructose to fat but there's this general assumption like fructose is driving fatty liver disease but they have tracer studies showing that the fat that accumulates in fatty liver 60 percent of it is coming from free fatty acids from our own fat stores and then you have about 25 percent coming from dietary carbs and the other 15 percent coming from dietary fat but when we see high levels of free fatty acids like that, that's telling us that we're in a chronically stressed state. We're seeing a lot of cortisol, adrenaline, glucagon that all increase lipolysis and increase free fatty acid release. And that's normally a state where we're generally seeing metabolic dysfunction. This can be driven by all sorts of things, you know, nutrient deficiencies, lack of movement and exercise, poor sleep. Obviously, you know, uh, endotoxin is a huge one here that it, endotoxin alone, which is, this is a toxin produced by bacteria in the gut, when especially we have bacterial overgrowths, that alone is shown to dry fatty liver disease. And when they actually provide fructose with an antibiotic to prevent any effects in the gut, 
you don't see any fatty liver being caused. And this is in, in rodent models where normally you can, you can see that caused when you give massive amounts of fructose. But so in any case, we can still have those things going on, those underlying metabolic derangements going on and not see as much body fat gain, but we will still accumulate it in the liver. Normally it's people who are not overeating as much. You know, most people when they're dealing with these sorts of metabolic issues, they're not producing energy. There's a lot of hunger. Like that's one of the main drivers of hunger is our livers are depleted of ATP. The hypothalamus in our brain is depleted of ATP. And that causes us to basically be constantly hungry. And most people are going to eat a lot as a result. And so you'll gain body fat and you'll also see uh, fatty liver disease as a result of this underlying metabolic problem. But you can have people who are really good at restricting and they don't overeat. And maybe there's some other reasons too why they don't, but they're still going to have that same under lying metabolic problem. And so you'll still see things like visceral fat accumulate. You'll still see the dysfunction at the liver. You'll still see like some of the cardio cardiovascular effects. So it's obviously like most disease processes, it's multifactorial, but it really comes back to interference with our ability to produce energy from the fuel that's coming in, leading to chronic stress, and then leading to basically having a lot of that substrate, a lot of the carbohydrates or fats, and having nowhere to put them, and then we store them as, as fat in the liver so, or elsewhere. Um, 